High stakes politics, presidential candidates courting Iowans, political journalists watching the Iowans' reactions. Journalists telling us what they're seeing on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. I am a runner. I'm a coach. I'm a teacher. I'm a fan. I am a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Now celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence, on statewide Iowa Public Television. This is the Friday, August 28th edition of Iowa Press. Here is Dean Borg. 17 Republicans seeking their party's presidential nomination, five for the Democratic colors, are creating plenty of news. But for journalists, it's a scheduling dilemma, just ask them. Among, the following, among those following candidates, Radio Iowa's news director, Kay Henderson, Associated Press, political writer, Catherine Lucy, Des Moines Register columnist Kathy Obradovich and WHO Television's political director David Price. Kathy, normally by this time in an election cycle, presidential election cycle, we would have had a winnowing device and that was the Iowa straw poll. We didn't have it, so is there any winnowing at all taking place? There's been churning uh, in the in the race. What's, we've what's seen churning? People, we've seen people go up and down the polls a little bit, um, and the first debate helped do that. I, you know, I think uh, we saw, for example, Carly Fiorina, the standout of what we called the undercard or the happy hour debate, the uh, the bottom of the poll candidates uh, on the Fox News debate move up a little bit. Um, there's been some shift at the top. Uh, I think that uh, you know, for example, Scott Walker, who's been in near the top of the polls in Iowa, has has slipped down a little bit. Um, but there's not been one event that has caused that. And without the straw poll, uh, we don't have people getting out of the race. So, uh, you know, for example, with the reports that Rick Perry um, had run out of money, mm -hmm. uh, but he's still campaigning in Iowa. He, there's no real incentive for him to get out because there's super PACs that are helping candidates uh, stay in the public eye, even though they can't directly coordinate. Rick Perry has a $17 million in his super PAC. Uh, the one thing that is, is striking me this cycle is that not only did we not have a straw poll, but on caucus night itself, there may not be a lot of impetus for these candidates to withdraw on the Republican side. Unlike the Democratic contest when some of the competitors may emerge from Iowa with zero because mm -hmm. they had zero delegates, and you have to have 15% support in a room to actually secure a delegate at the precinct level, on the Republican side, it will be just raw votes. So it may be possible that all 17 emerge from the Iowa caucuses and continue on limping, some of them, <laughs> to New Hampshire, but there may not be a winnowing effect after the Iowa caucuses. Although it may, I think, the if they all stay in, which as of right now, if you have you know money for gas, you can keep campaigning in <laughs> Iowa, um, the Iowa caucus certainly might at least sort of better define who the leaders are right. and who actually exactly. has a chance. It doesn't seem like it's going to set up one or two people, though, because there's just so many of them. I, I, I spoke, uh, Dave Price, with uh, Senator Grassley this past week and asked him uh, about possible endorsement and so on. We'll talk about that just a little bit later. But he also observed, no, there is no clear leader right now, and uh, it'll be December, I think, he said, uh, before we really see, because Iowans really just want to shake hands and have coffee with the candidates and, and look them over. Is that how you say it? Well, I think we have the, the new emergence of the super PACs, so like Kay pointed out, so that's keeping Rick Perry alive. His sugar daddies put that super PAC together so they can help keep him on the air, keep, keep things going, so you keep the Perry name out there. So you have that current part of it, but I, 
I look back to the last cycle, too, about how we watched all those polls go up and down. And for somebody like Rick Santorum, who yeah. nobody was paying attention to last cycle, so he kept plugging along and everybody else kind of had their time in the spotlight and then collapsed. And it seems like everybody, including Rick Santorum, thinks that could happen again. So they look at the Trump numbers and think, okay, that's not sustainable. Surely this guy's going to finally cross the line and blow up, and there needs to be somebody there to replace him. In fact, that's what he said on this program last week, Rick Santorum. Which said, he has to I'm say. not worried about where I'm standing in the rest of the polls and, and, and the standings. I'm doing okay. In fact, this is where I was, Kathy, in 2012. And look what I did. I won it. And, and you think about it. Uh, in 2012, people were saying, oh, you know, people will get home uh, over, the, over the Thanksgiving holiday and they'll, make it, they'll talk with their family and they'll make up their mind for sure over Thanksgiving. Well, they didn't really. They didn't make up their mind really until about... Uh, uh, you know, the end of December, right before yeah. the caucuses. And uh, now the caucuses are a month later. They're in yeah. February. So, uh, you know, people do actually do have a little bit more time to make up their mind than they did four years well, ago. Catherine, is, is this, as she mentioned, uh, the difference in the dates of the caucuses, but is this caucus campaign different than 2012 in any other aspect that you have been able to observe? Well, this is actually my first caucus in Iowa, so I'm not the best uh, you know, uh, experience to compare it to previous cycles. But what I would say is that um, when you talk to voters, they, a lot of people don't seem decided right now. Um, that when I talk to people, you hear a lot of, I have a top three, I have a top five. Certainly at the state fair, when folks are coming out, a lot of the you know, people who identified as being active Republican you know, caucus goers were saying they really were still weighing a couple options. Even the, the, the giant crowds around Donald Trump, a lot of people I talked to were saying, well, I really like him, but I'm still also looking at, you know, several other candidates. I think the so, Democrats yeah. are more settled yeah, than the Republicans, true. actually. With 17 candidates in the, de in the Republican field, um, people are still trying everybody out. The Democrats, uh, people are getting to know the candidates a lot yeah. better now. However, the Democrat field may not actually be set. Um, it, there's uh, increased talk about Joe Biden and where he is and whether he might fit into the Democratic field. And we'll get to that as we get to the Democrats. I cut you off a moment ago, okay? Uh, do you remember what you were going to say? No, please okay. proceed. Well, <laughs> <laughs> then I'll ask you then, Kay, is Iowa unique? That is, are the candidates standing in Iowa, what's happening across the nation? Because they're paying attention to that too because that's their access to the public stage in the debates. Well, I think it's interesting if you look at the candidates leading in a recent poll in Iowa. Donald Trump, Ben Carson, Scott Walker, third place, Carly Fiorina, fourth place. What do three of those four people have in common? They've never held elective office. I covered Scott Walker this past week in Greenfield, and he's trying to make the point that people aren't angry. They're just feeling a sense of urgency. If I'm out there on the stump, people are angry. Republicans have been voting for Republican candidates for the past few election cycles, and they feel as if they haven't gotten the goods they were promised. And they see in Donald Trump someone who speaks they like the the thoughts that are internal mm -hmm. their internal monologue they're seeing donald trump say on the stump and so that's why he's so energizing to a huge part of the electorate in just a moment i want to come back to you you were in dubuque this Correct. week and i want to come back and and have us hear what you saw but dave you want to say something well uh, we have this booth that started as a a thing to do on a slow news day, frankly. But we set up this booth at the State Fair, and we have people... WHO did. Uh, right, yeah. WHO TV did. And we set up all these mason jars, and we let people vote with a piece of corn, okay? Very, very scientific <laughs> issue, as you might guess. But it's a great place to people watch and to eavesdrop on mm -hmm. people's conversations. So we had almost 60,000 people come by our booth during the time of the State Fair. And Donald Trump was by and far and away the most talked about person and candidate that we had. And he took one out of every four pieces of corn in people's support there. I mean, it was so, so lopsided. And I, uh, Hillary Clinton came with about 18 percent, if memory serves. But on the Republican side, to echo what Kay said, the top three finishers were Donald Trump, Ben Carson, Carly Fiorina. There was such an anger at the current state of politics from people on Trump's side, it was people mad at Democrats and Republicans alike, and we had people say, I'm a lifelong Democrat, I'm going for Trump, I'm tired of all the rest yeah. of them. But there was a very tangible 
anger and frustration with the way things are going. That's interesting, not from the aspect of who got the most kernels of corn, because that is unscientific. <laughs> I could have come back 16 times and put in uh, one of a job. We have but, security measures in place. <laughs> <laughs> but what you heard was important. Very, Kate, very tell important. us what went on with Donald Trump and the news conference that got so much exposure on social media and uh, traditional media, too, uh, in that news conference. Well, uh, I don't want to dwell on it too much. Uh, it's never bad politics for a Republican candidate to attack the media. And this was an episode in which Donald Trump did so very effectively on an issue that has proven very effective for his campaign on immigration reform. Uh, there was a gentleman representing Univision, uh, Jorge Ramos, who was at the news conference, who stood up to ask a question. Uh, Trump said, sit down. Uh, a security guard removed him from the room. A few minutes later, a reporter for NBC News asked Trump, why didn't you answer his question? Would you allow him back in the room? A, a Trump campaign person went out, got him back, and then toward the end of this half-hour news conference, uh, the two of them, Jorge Ramos from Univision and Donald Trump, engaged in a five-minute discussion mm -hmm. about immigration reform. It completely overshadowed Trump's 55-minute appearance uh, mm -hmm. before about 3,500 people in Dubuque, at which he was talking about, I'm representing the silent majority. Um, it's interesting that Donald Trump is embracing this phrase, silent majority, that was coined by Richard Nixon, if we will all remember correctly. Uh, but, but he's saying, I'm tapping into this silent majority who is fed up and they're not going to take it anymore. Yeah, yeah. And if you talk to people at that event in Dubuque, there were people who were supporting other candidates. Um, there are people who are very energized and they feel as if Donald Trump is voicing their displeasure with the political machinery. Another uh, candidate's campaign manager, Iowa campaign manager, was mentioned at that news conference as well, Sam Clovis. Uh, Sam Clovis was a candidate for the U.S. Senate here in Iowa, mm -hmm. uh, lost to Joni Ernst. Uh, he had been supporting Rick Perry. He'd been a key member of the Perry leadership yep. team. He is now uh, the national co-chair and a senior policy advisor on the Trump campaign. He's being paid for his services. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of discussion about that defection. Okay, any significance there that Sam Clovis is, has moved over? Not not that it's Sam Clovis, but had he's left the Rick Perry campaign? Well, I, it, it obviously is a reflection that, um, you know, Rick Perry's campaign is uh, running on fumes. Um, and But it also, I think, is a reflection on Sam Clovis that um, he decided to, um, once he was, wasn't was being paid by Perry, decided to jump ship to another candidate. Um, and that, uh, is, that kind of thing, uh, you know, recalls the defection of Kent Sorensen from the Michelle Bachman campaign in 2012, which, which ended up being um, a whole circus um, a, for a variety of reasons that aren't present with this Perry issue. But, you know, it, it is something where, you know, Iowa gets the impression sometimes that everybody is out to make a buck out, off the caucuses. And, and that's not necessarily the way, uh, you know, our political leaders necessarily want the caucuses to be perceived. The other thing I will say about the summer of Trump, which he embraced that phrase too, <laughs> is that it is keeping our attention away from what's happening in the Paul world. Um, there have been indictments. Um, there are people who are closely associated with not only Ron Paul, but related uh, by marriage to Rand Paul, who are now under indictment. Um, some serious charges, mm -hmm. um, another investigation involving a laptop owned by uh, a person who worked on Ron Paul's campaign uh, being stolen um, after the gentleman passed away. Uh, so the summer of Trump is eclipsing any real discussion about what's going on with Rand Paul and the Ron Paul family. And it feels like Rand is staying away. Oh, gosh. We are definitely not seeing him in our state. Didn't come to the fair. Um, he has not been around. And I'm glad that you mentioned that uh, because another statement that Senator Grassley made to me, Catherine, this week mm -hmm. is that Donald Trump at the present time is just sucking all the oxygen, as he put it, out of the campaign for everybody else. It, 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 how are they going to overcome that, if at all? I mean, it, it's true. Uh, he is the story right now. He is getting the biggest headlines. He's getting the most news coverage. And you can see lots of news organizations you know, have moved reporters who were covering off other candidates onto Trump, you know, so they, uh, he is he, he is the story. And I guess what you're seeing is 
other candidates trying to get attention by responding to him and in some cases moving their positions more aggressively as a result of him and you know this you know, is, is a, is a, has mixed results you know you're seeing Jeb Bush responding a lot to some of Trump's language around immigration around anchor babies and remains to be seen how that plays for him further along. And, and Perry tried that and it hasn't gone anywhere he was yeah. the most aggressive yeah. early on mm -hmm. and that hasn't shown any Lindsey any Graham value. As well. Lindsey yeah. Graham as well. Scott Walker tried with mm -hmm. the birthright citizenship and took somehow took three positions on that issue in about six or seven days' time, <laughs> which really calls into question about his what the heck does he believe in all, as he's trying to follow all of this Trump surge. It's another way of playing out the, the dilemma that Republicans have every four years, which is, you know, Jeb Bush said, I may have to lose the primary to win the election. And he, it was uh, dumb for him to say that probably, but uh, it was true. And now we've got a bunch of candidates like Scott Rocker, for example, who are, are trying to win the primary, but they're putting themselves in jeopardy, I think, in November um, by, by chasing Trump um, as far to the right as they can. And the candidate who uh, is not chasing Trump, if you will, Ted Cruz, had a pretty significant rally that didn't get a lot of attention. He had a rally for religious liberty uh, on Friday night of last week, which more than 2,500 evangelical Christians attended, um, many of whom were not tr uh, cr Ted Cruz supporters when they walked out in that room, came out impressed with him. Uh, Steve King stood on that stage, didn't actually endorse Ted Cruz, but you know, with a wink and a nod said, hey, I like this guy. Um, I'd keep your eye on uh, somebody like a Ted Cruz if, if the Trump bubble bursts, because he is positioned uh, on some of the same issues to energize those voters who are presently supporting Trump. In fact, Trump. Is, is positioning himself Correct. to take advantage of that if Correct. that were to happen. He's the most outsidery insider of the whole, <laughs> of the whole right. I mean, he has uh, definitely set himself against the establishment in Washington, um, but he actually has been elected before, and it, no, no one, no candidate has ever won the Iowa caucuses who has never been elected to anything before. Catherine, let's uh, turn to Hillary Clinton right now. Are you seeing the the crowds of the Hillary Clinton crowds are they supporters can you discern are they supporters or are they celebrity watchers I, I would say I mean I, uh, Hillary Clinton's been here quite a lot I've been at a number of her events and and she's getting enthusiastic response and I think by and large the people there are supporters I mean there um, she had a big event this week in uh, Ankeny. At Ankeny, and she was out. I saw her in Eastern Iowa. She had a, several hundred people at a, um, a winery, and I talked to a lot of people there who said that they were going to support her. What do you think about the Tom Vilsack, former Iowa governor and uh, now agriculture secretary in the Obama administration, about his endorsement this week of Hillary Clinton? I'm not so much the endorsement per se, but the timing of it. Is that at all timed for anything that's happening in Iowa with her campaign? Um, certainly, they're trying to show a lot of strength right now um, and send the message that they are they have a solid organization here, that they have support here. So they've been rolling out uh, you know, former Senator Harkin's endorsement uh, and then the Vilsack endorsement. And uh, this week, they sent out a memo noting you know, the organization they've done here, so the number of volunteers they have, the number of offices. They want to be very clear that they're making a strong play for Iowa and the, and the early voting states and that they're and they're positioned, you know, in a good way here. Uh, I mean, we all know that Joe Biden is wrestling with the idea of running again. And having someone who's a part of the Obama administration, sure. the Secretary of Agriculture, endorse the candidacy of someone who used to be part of the, mm -hmm. of the Obama administration sure sends a signal to somebody, and it's mm -hmm. Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. You had uh, Senator Harkin, who previously endorsed uh, Secretary Clinton this, this month, making that even more clear in an interview with a news organization. You also had the Clinton people trotting out the endorsement of Brad Anderson, who was the 2012 campaign manager for Obama. They are trying. Here in Iowa. It, it's yeah. a show of force. Um, it's not terribly subtle, I would think, <laughs> uh, to tell Joe Biden that, hey, we've got a campaign on the ground here, and it is formidable. And that, the, the memo you were talking about, and they all do their memos now, and they mm -hmm. just put two interested parties and they send it to the media, but they did that for all four early states. Yeah. So adding that to the Harkin endorsement, to the Vilsack yes. endorsement, this memo that they send out, it's, look, we're, 
we're tough here. Yeah. Good luck. They're getting working in. very hard here, and they want that to be the, clear. The Des Moines Register has a new uh, Iowa poll coming out this weekend, and uh, without uh, it will be on the web on Saturday night and in the newspapers on Sunday. And uh, so I can't give anything away there, but but I will say I don't think that Joe Biden is what really Hillary Clinton has to worry about. Uh, she needs to be worried about Bernie Sanders, and I can tell you Bernie Sanders voters are probably not going to be too impressed by the endorsements of Tom Vilsack and Tom Harkin. Uh, the, they're anti-establishment voters. Um, they are not necessarily um, people who have been caucusing forever. And um, you know, you look at what's been happening in New Hampshire. Um, you know, I think that Hillary Clinton also has to look over her shoulder in Iowa. Republic Bert, yeah, yeah, Republicans always, uh, you know, are inclined to pick whose turn it is. Um, so Democrats are in a strange position because they they almost never really, really like to be in that position. We all remember how um, Bill Bradley gave uh, Al Gore a run for his money, especially at this time in 1999. Uh, so it, Democrats, by and large, really dislike this kind of, uh, it's my turn. Dave, Demo Democrats will blanch at what I'm going to say here, but <laughs> <laughs> is Bernie Sanders the mirror of Donald Trump for the Democratic Party. I don't know if they're mirrors, well, but I, I'm, there's... I'm keying off anti-establishment. There's no doubt, and if you looked at the crowds at the state fair, and li again, listening into those conversations, there are some similarities there. Now, when maybe when you really dig in there, you're gonna see, you're gonna see some pretty clear differences among Trump supporters and Sanders supporters, perhaps, but Sanders supporters are very much upset at the system. We need to throw everything out and start over here, which is fascinating because Bernie Sanders has been in elected office forever. I mean, he's not Donald Trump here, but you get a sense of that same fervor from his people that, look, it's time. It's time. We it need some representation. Me of, uh, of uh, Ron Paul from the Very last couple of cycles. So. Uh, Bernie Sanders gets this sort of counterculture kind of chic, you know, about supporting him. And and I think that the Ron Paul campaign also had that, where you've got these two very unlikely type of candidates that, that young people are rallying around. If by some stroke of imagination here, Joe Biden would declare, does he have, uh, Kay, an organization here in Iowa that he can step into, or what kind of a, a campaign can we expect at this late date? Exactly. There's been a draft Biden movement. Folks have been in the state trying to lay some groundwork for him. And quite frankly, there are a core of Biden supporters who've been with him since 1987, right. some of them <laughs> since 2007, who've been waiting on the sidelines mm -hmm. for him to make his decision before they go over to the Clinton campaign. And so he does have people here. He has by no means any of the organization that even a Martin O'Malley has in Iowa. So he starts uh, from a disadvantage in Iowa. His big advantage is people know who Joe Biden is now. There's deep affection for Joe right. Biden in, in Iowa. I mean, and there's lots of people who would like to see him run. But well, it's a steep yes. climb to get that he organization get that he would need unless up. he starts picking off people from yeah. others. Well, mm -hmm. but starting late in Iowa mm -hmm. also helps lower expectations. And, and so he wouldn't necessarily be expected to come in really late and win the Iowa caucuses. So that, that might help him get over that hump that he was never able to get over when he ran before in 2008. But you don't want to get fourth here for him. Lower ex. No, you don't, you don't want to come there. in below uh, Martin O'Malley for sure. But it would take some of the percentage that Hillary Clinton is perceived and expected to win by, and what would that do to her campaign, Kathy? Uh, I think that actually um, that her campaign and Bernie Sanders' campaign would be affected. Okay. Um, let, 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 pulls the, everybody's numbers down. We've only a couple of minutes left here, and I want to turn briefly to the Iowa legislature, and that is the Iowa K, the Iowa House of Representatives, uh, elected new leadership. Why was that necessary, and uh, w what does it portend? House Speaker Craig Paulson, who by his own admission stayed in the House longer than he ever imagined, almost twice as long. <laughs> <laughs> a member of the Iowa House, has decided he will not seek re-election. Um, it makes sense strategically to have the person in charge of running Republicans for re-election in 2016 to be in charge. And so Linda Upmeyer has won that election. Her father was Speaker of the House in the 1980s. Uh, she has ascended. She has a leadership team that has come behind her. Um, we also have uh, the specter of Chuck Soderberg, who is the person who'd been the architect of the state budget, uh, resigning to take a job with the Electric Cooperatives Association. Mm -hmm. So we do have some 
rather large changes, but I don't think the deck chairs are going to be arranged very much because she was part of leadership and we still have the same governor. We still have the same majority leader in Michael Gronstall, Democrats in the Senate. I don't think the prosecution of the 2016 legislative session will change dramatically. The governor, though, has made some changes as well. His chief of staff has moved on, um, and now his legislative liaison has moved on. So um, he is going to have some different people who uh, are going to be in charge of working with the legislature. And, you know, that, that relationship broke down a little bit the last legislative session with these, uh, these really controversial vetoes of uh, money for education. Um, so uh, he is, in, in a sense, starting with a, a clean or slate working with the next legislature. I, and I think the thing we'll all watch is how involved Kim Reynolds will be in the last Barry. two years of the, of the Terry Branstead administration. Yeah. What about, uh, the, the Dave, the Senate? How, of course, uh, we're coming Mike up Ronsall in election year. will still be in charge. Yes, yes. <laughs> as far as we know. <laughs> but, but a woman in charge of the uh, House of Representatives doesn't make any difference in, in the working relationships there, do you think? I don't know, because for all the points Kay just made, I mean, Linda Upmeyer was still so involved before. Now she's just ascended one notch here to speaker, but they still yeah. all had to work together before. I don't know that it and really Linda changes Upmeyer anything there. And Linda is credited, rightly, um, you know, with, with being with one of the key people who helped broker mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. uh, Medicaid expansion deal two years ago. She worked across uh, yeah, the aisle with that, uh, with the Senate. So she really, I mean, she does have experience, I think, uh, you know, working with the Senate and putting together some pretty significant stuff. Worth mentioning too, she's the first woman yeah. ever to serve as Speaker of the Iowa House. Yeah. And the political legacy that Kay has already mentioned with her father being the Speaker of the House at one point too. All right. Thanks for your insights. As we close this edition, I want to note the passing this week of David Stanley of Muscatine. During the past decades, David was a frequent guest here at the Iowa Press Table because he was a pillar in the state's political landscape. I first came to know his courteous but firm persona when covering the Iowa legislature where he at that time was serving as the Senate's Republican majority leader. Mr. Stanley never wavered from championing his conservative principles in dealing with the state's financial matters. He cared and he carried that philosophy into two unsuccessful campaigns for the U.S. Senate, losing to Democrats Harold Hughes and then to John Culver. He didn't retire, though. In fact, he last appeared on this program just a few months ago in his leadership role with the Iowans for Tax Relief Organization. He contributed greatly to the Iowa he loved. Well, next week on Iowa Press, 3rd District Republican Congressman David Young. Now, he's eight months into his first term and has an experienced Democratic campaigner challenging him, hoping to make it his last. Congressman David Young, next Friday night at 7.30, noon Sunday. I'm Dean Borg. Thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. I'm a veteran. I'm a builder. I'm a volunteer. I am a teacher. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. Iowa Community Foundations, an initiative of the Iowa Council of Foundations, connecting donors to the causes and communities they care about, for good, for Iowa, forever. Details at iowacommunityfoundations.org. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN supplies authorized users with dedicated internet and data connections to enhance their mission of protecting the citizens of Iowa with a private and secure statewide fiber optic network.